flip over. So here's that wave going here, and then it hits the wall. And what's going to leave the wall is going to be a wave going in the opposite direction. A reflective wave. Maybe not as intense, but that's you know, essentially what happens when you have what's called a discontinuity. Discontinuity is whenever the impedance changes along the way. You had this rope, you had a big fat knot there. The wave goes down that rope, when it hits the knot, it's going to come back you know, out of phase. It'll be a reflection. And when it's 180 degrees out of phase, it's going to subtract from the amplitude. These two amplitudes will add together, and you'll, this will be diminished by that. So you don't want that to happen. What you used to get also, when you had those uh, reflections from those rings, those guide rings, is you had a TV picture. There's 525 lines in an old-fashioned analog TV set. And that picture used to be done I was going to say 60, but it's actually done 30 full frames per second. There were 60, 60 scans, but basically uh, 262 lines were scanned, and then for the other half second, the other 262 and a half lines were scanned. So you, you look at 525 lines 30 times a second. If you multiply these two numbers together, um, this times this is 15, 750. That's how many lines were scanned per second in the TV picture in the old days when you had 525 lines of analog data. If you divide 15,750 into 1, meaning you had this many cycles per second, so how much, per, how much time per cycle was there? About 62 and a half microseconds. Do the math yourself. Wow. 62 and a half millionths of a second. All right, even at the speed of light, when a wave goes up here and bounces back, it takes a few millionths of a second to get there, even at the speed it's going, even at 300 million meters per second. So where do you think it shows up? On your TV screen, it shows up, here's a piece of pixel data, it shows up a tiny bit later as a ghost. Or is in this case maybe it's a little fuzziness. In other words, instead of a sharp line, you have a fuzzier line. So you didn't get as clean a picture using the old-fashioned twin line as you do with the coax, which doesn't have that problem. The ring around there is not going to be seen because the shielding of the outer conductor prevents that from happening. Well, my goodness, if this thing doesn't change its potential, what happens here? You know, I got a signal like this. Well, this thing has to go twice as much in amplitude swings in order to make a difference of potential between this, which is zero, and this, which is the center conductor, be the equivalent, but it, so it does. The point is, the outside stands still. The potential is zero. The conductor inside does all the oscillation. It's the relative potential between what's in the center and what's in the shield that is the voltage that you want to transmit, even if it's at radio frequencies. That's what transmission lines are. That's how they work. This is what antennas are. That's how they work. The traveling waves go through this stuff or through this twin line stuff and they cancel each other out because the wave going up one wire is equal and opposite to the wave coming down the other side. When they see each other, they add up to zero because the positive excursion here is added to the negative excursion on the other side. And in theory, they should add to zero. So a transmission line doesn't transmit. It just transmits the power to the antenna. And the antenna does. And the antenna gets its properties physically from its physical size and the way it's shaped, the way it's laid out. And that's all it takes to be an antenna. It's a passive device. It doesn't add power to the system. And yet people think about antennas when they buy them. Hey, this antenna has more gain than that antenna. But it's passive. How can it get being gain? Okay, so in your example there, I assume mm -hmm. that's a, a dipole, <coughs> right? You what? You do what? That's a dipole that you. That's a dipole. Oh, yeah, okay. I didn't mention that. <laughs> so, this configuration is called a dipole. Why? It's got two poles. Okay. 
So the so. center conductor of the coax is going to one of those legs, mm -hmm. and the shield is going to those other legs. Correct. That other leg, but that other leg is grounded, so mm -hmm. there's not a return path there. It doesn't. How does it doesn't work? work very efficiently when you do that. Okay. When you do that, if you want to use coax to feed this thing, you really need to add a feature called a ballon well, which is a transformer. When you have a coaxial cable here that's in this twin line, you would put a thing in here that's a transformer, and it couples to this winding of the transformer, and that's how you get around that problem. So you have what's called a balanced feed line because each can float, each one has potential, it can shift up and down. I'm sorry, if you had a flat line, you wouldn't need this guy because that's what you would do. But if you happen to have one that's got a fixed potential, then you transform it so that the secondary winding of the transformer, the dependent part of the process, will float and can have potential that can, float, uh, can rise or fall to any value. And therefore, this will have the same potential as that over the cycle eventually. But that solves that problem. Yeah, are you good point. Really great observation. Are you shrinking the overall length of the antenna when you are putting in that transformer? No. Or is the length of the antenna is a function of the frequency on which it's operating because that determines the wavelength. Um, let me do some erasing here, but it's worth repeating. Time and frequency are inverse properties. When time goes up, frequency goes down. If you have a million cycles per second, you have a cycle every millionth of a second. If you have a thousand cycles per second, you have a cycle every thousandth of a second. So this equation, T is 1 over F, meaning time is the inverse of frequency. There's one important concept here. Another important concept here is that you've got one wavelength here, another wavelength here. This is time, this is propagation rate, this is how long it takes at the speed of light to move along from where the signal starts to where it ends up. And the distance from crest to crest, or the distance from any two points in the cycle that are the same, meaning this is crossing the zero axis going positively, crossing the zero axis going positively. That is wavelength, symbolized by the Greek letter lambda. That wavelength gets shorter when the frequency gets higher because, again, it's a fixed amount of time to go this far. If you're Shifting from positive to zero to negative to zero, or positive max to zero to negative max. I always want to make that point emphatic because this is not negative. It's a maximum in the negative direction. It's not subtracting. It's just going in a different direction, getting opposite polarity. Um, if it's doing that oscillation at a higher rate, the distance between those peaks on each side is going to be less. It's going to be closer together. And the relationship's very simple. The speed of light, I use the zero meaning speed of light in free space, but it can be speed of light in any medium, is equal to that frequency times that wavelength. If f goes up, lambda has to go down to compensate for it. And a simple example, you have a two meter handheld radio and the ham radio. Okay, two meters. Um, this is 300 million meters per second, 300 times 10 to the sixth. Ten, five, one followed by six zeros is a million. And if the frequency is, um, well, let's put it this way. If the wavelength is two meters, then we know this times something equals this. So what's the frequency at two meters? 145 meters. Yeah, 144 to 148, that's approximately 150. So 150 million cycles per second. 150 times 2 is 300. The equation works.
So that shouldn't actually answer my question. Oh, but maybe, go ahead. Maybe I'm not, <laughs> answer, maybe I'm not asking it right. Mm -hmm. So when you've got the dipole there with the coax and yeah, it's the transformer right. right there, yeah. so you've got a, a set wavelength or half wavelength that, yeah. that, that is. Now, if you were to switch that to a ladder line, you have one side of of the wave going down one side and the inverse going down the other side, does that double the size of your antenna? No, it has nothing to do with the size of the antenna. The size of the antenna has to correspond to the frequency of the signal because you want it to have a zero crossing at the endpoints, which it can only be the case if this happens to be Lambda over two, one half wavelength, one. This is a full wavelength, this and all the dotted line over here. So if you got a two meter signal, the full wavelength is two meters. That's the point where this is positively going across the zero axis and it doesn't happen again until you're over here. That's the full wavelength. Half that distance is a half wavelength, which is one meter. One meter is roughly three feet. That's how long a two meter antenna should be to do the job. If it's a dipole, now you'll say the one that's attached to my little handheld radio is not. Let's cover that reason right now. Which was actually kind of the next thing I was going to bring up. But what's interesting about what I'm going to bring up is if you do what I'm about to do, you don't have to have this transformer to convert the unbalanced coaxial cable unbalanced because one is a fixed potential, the other varies, versus the twin line, which is balanced because each has the same swings of potential. And that's what they actually call them as balanced and unbalanced transmission lines. Um, if you look at the radio antenna on a car or someone some of the later TVs. You didn't have two sticks, you only had one. If you look at that, that the broadcast antenna on your car, it's only one stick, one pole. That's not a dipole, it's a unipole. Okay, given what we just learned now about how antennas are supposed to work, how do they get away with that one? And the answer is, there are, there are two poles, you just don't see the other one quite the way you think you normally would see it. It's the rest of your car. The rest of the car. So the body of the car is the other pole. So here's the option. Um, here's your car. There's the antenna. Here's the transmitter with this output coil feeding the antenna right there. The other pole is connected to the body of the car, literally it's grounded to the chassis. Does that work? Yes, not as efficiently as a dipole does, but it does work. They call this opposite pole the counterpoise. But what you have is the body of the car acts as a somewhat fixed potential. It isn't, but it's got so massively greater amount of metal in it that it sort of seems that way. It approximates it pretty well. Um, they tell me if I want to put an HF radio on my boat, there's only, you know, those frequencies only enough room to put one pole on there. You know, cell boaters tend to use the backstay as that antenna. What do you do for the opposite pole, the body of the boat? But my, body, my boat's fiberglass, so I'm not going to what am I going to do? If it was a metal, you know, if it was a steel hull boat, I'd have it made. I'd just attach the boat and done. Uh, well, they put a lot of metal <laughs> where there isn't any. You take sheets of copper and you attach the engines and anything. And if you're a sailboater, you're really lucky because you got this keel down there that generally is metal. It's stuck in the water, which generally is conductive because of the stuff in it, not because of the water itself. And you're done. That's what they do. Now, if you have a handheld, HT, and you've got an antenna here, there are two things at play. One is you've got this little 
conductor at the bottom of the antenna, that little lump that you see in the thing that connects to the radio. And the transmitter has its output stage connected to the chassis of the radio, and the other goes to this antenna. And again, the body of the radio, the metal box that is inside that plastic that you're holding, the chassis, is the counterpoise, and it forms the second pole of the dipole antenna. You can't get around the physics. You need to have both halves of the antenna in play in order to be able to resonate a half wavelength worth of antenna. But that thing's not a half wavelength, because we just said on two meters, well, you know, half wavelength is one meter. And let's just say, okay, we got the box is one of the two poles, the other pole that uh, is sticking up in the air should be half a meter. Oh, good. I can get away with only being about 20 inches instead of uh, 39, which is almost 40 inches. 20 inches is, you know, it's a big stick waving around. And we know that we see little things called rubber ducks there. Now, they do a lot of other tricks, too. Inside the antenna, you might actually have a coil in there, meaning it's a helial. It's a helical antenna. That has some of the features of this and this. But why are we doing that coil? What's, what's the coil doing for us? You already know, because I had this example for you many times. But you're not going to look at it in a different light. What did we have? Going on, we had this AC with an inductor, a light bulb, and a capacitor all tied together. We had a variable cap or a variable inductor or a variable capacitor. And you, you tuned them, so to speak. You adjusted the inductance here or the capacitance here so that this guy and this guy would cancel out. Okay, now is the time to bring up a very interesting question. You've got two halves of this process. One's called the generator, one's called the load. Generator's producing the radio signal, the load is...